Welcome back to another episode of the Design Build Hunt podcast, which is presented by Whitetail Partners. I've got a big crew on the on the line, not on the phone, on the line with me today here uh, over basically Zoom. I've got Jake from Michigan, Lee from Tennessee, Tim from Wisconsin, and Dylan, the newcomer from Kansas. Dylan, I want to I want to start with you, man. Uh, give us a quick introduction to who you are and how you got linked up with us here at Whitetail Partners. Yeah, I appreciate it, Josh. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dylan here from Kansas, and I've heard a lot about you guys, followed y'all for quite a while, and uh, kind of happened by accident, actually. You know, I was kind of getting busy with some of this stuff just, just through uh, friends and family reaching out, and um, kind of became a little bit of a side deal, not so much for pay, but it was just one of them things where, uh, you know, everybody wanted your time. And unfortunately, you know, when the family takes that hit, it's like, we got to do something. And so, uh, saw you guys out there and reached out to Sam to see if there was anybody in the area and thought it'd be kind of a fun, fun gig. So yeah, it's definitely uh, been that it's been kind of a, a quite the learning process, just, just seeing how things operate, but it's been a lot of fun. You know, I really appreciate the opportunity and good to be on here with you guys. Yeah, man, we're glad to have you on. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you hunt. You you say the word Kansas, and people are like, habitat management, why? Like, just like there's yeah. one species behind every tree, right? You don't have to do anything out there. You just show up and shoot a big deer. Yeah. You know, you'll probably find me uh, defending the state a little bit. I, I do think there's also a reason for that. You hear a lot of negative stuff, you know, or I shouldn't say negative, but more or less just how easy it is. And I think the style of hunting out here and a lot of the hunters here are, um, you know, in that class to where not a lot of added pressure and they, they they're just a little bit of a different mindset i mean i love seeing some of the aggressive nature of some of the other other states and some of the great hunters out there um don't get me wrong uh kansas has definitely got a little more opportunity there so you gotta you to be able to take big deer you gotta hunt where they're at so i'm pretty i've been fortunate to have that you know and so just the hard work and the grind kind of i think is all still similar but uh yeah, yeah. you might you might have a little different three-year-old than you have in other parts of the country so yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. Well, we're excited to follow along with you and see uh, what all you have going on there. It's a wonderful state to have the opportunity to uh, to serve landowners in. So what what is kind of your region? So you're in Kansas, but what else do you cover? Yeah, um, for now, really kind of covering the southern portion of Nebraska, southern Iowa, uh, Missouri, um, and, and really just just that area so far. Um, have visions of kind of reaching out a little bit further, but, uh, yeah, just trying to get my feet wet and making sure that, uh, we're doing a quality job. And that's kind of the biggest thing is I want to offer, you know, a quality service and, you know, make sure we're building that partnership and, you know, being that, being that friend and, and somebody that's, you know, willing to be able to be approachable, you know, as far as reaching out, we want to make sure that we're available and, and providing the best thing we can. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that's been, that's been huge since the beginning. I mean, ever since we started expanding here at Whitetail Partners, ever since Sam started bringing some of us on, um, you know, the emphasis has always been on serving landowners well above and beyond growth. So growth will be slower. Growth will look different maybe than if we were a little bit more aggressive. But our number one priority is those partnerships, those friendships that we have, those relationships that we have and value a lot with our, with our current clients and making sure that they're well taken care of. And we never want to do anything to jeopardize our ability to take care of them well, to come through on our deliverables in a timely manner. And uh, yeah, to keep doing our best for every single client. We don't want to grow at the expense of the quality of the work that we're doing. So uh, man, you've got, uh, you, there, there could be a lot worse states on the list there. You mentioned you're like Missouri, Southern Nebraska, Southern Iowa, and Kansas. It's like, oh, all right. So everywhere big deer live, uh, Dylan pretty much covers it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see some quality habitat. You know, that's the thing. We're pretty diverse here in Kansas, but I know we've got a lot of that just in the surrounding states. So yeah, I think we've got a lot to offer. Good deal. Well, gentlemen, for tonight, we've got a Q&A episode. So uh, we were going to record actually last week. Uh, some different things happened. A couple people couldn't join. I ended up having to take our daughter to the ER. She fell and hit her head while skating. And there was some like, uh oh, what do we do kind of moments going on there. So we rescheduled. Here we are tonight with a lot of questions to try to cover. One of the things I love about working with Whitetail Partners and the team that we have is how diverse it is, not only in our backgrounds, 
uh, but also just where we are with people in Michigan and Kansas and Wisconsin and Tennessee and Georgia and Ohio and all over the place. So this is really, really good to get perspectives from people uh, across the whitetails range, really. And so tonight I'm going to be posing a couple of questions to you. And as we work through these questions, I would love to hear, you know, uh, Jake's answer and how that's going to be different maybe than Tim's answer and how that may be different from Lee's answer. So I'm really excited to hear not only how the climate of where you are and the terrain of where you are changes this up, but also just hunting culture, how for a lot of things, we might just do things a little bit differently and, and that's okay. There are things that work a little bit differently with different regions. So uh, kicking things off here, we are a, a lot of people were interested in learning more about food plots. So I'm going to lob an easy one here at the very beginning and start with this. What is the best time to frost seed clover? Best time to frost seed clover. Now, this is something that uh, I did not have a lot of experience with growing up. Growing up in Mobile, Alabama, we have whole winters where there is no frost anything. It doesn't get below freezing, so there is no frost anything. So you guys school me a little bit here. Maybe start with Jake. I know that's something you do. Yeah, we do this every year. And I would a lot of these answers, I think that's going to be a – it's going to be, it depends, you know, kind of depending on the scenario, uh, the, the, you want to frost seed during the freeze thaw cycle. It just, the ground cracks a lot. And then with it, during the night when it freezes and as the warms up during the day, it, uh, you know, those cracks fill in. And so when you put the seed on the ground, those seeds kind of get pulled into the ground. That's kind of the, the idea behind frost seeding during the freeze thaw cycle. So whenever it's freezing at night and then warming up, above freezing during the day. That's kind of the time period that you want to do it. But that happens anywhere up here from January through April. So that's where I kind of said it depends. And it almost depends on where your food plot's located. So if, if you're frost seeding uh, uh, like maybe a larger field, you know, in the open, no trees around, you know, you're, it's a maybe an upland setting, you know, it's probably okay to frost seed as that snow is pretty close to melting. Because if you, if you frost seed on top of snow, when it melts, if it melts fast, your seed can get washed away. And but it, but if it's uh, the, the snow is close to being melted, you could probably frost seed on top of the snow and be fine. The snow will melt down, leave your seed on top of the soil. It'll get pulled in. You'll probably have a couple more snows to to kind of work it in. But if you have a food plot that's maybe in a lowland setting maybe near a swamp, near a river, in that area, it maybe is prone to flooding and you frost seed that area too soon, you know, when you get a heavy melt, everything floods, again, your seed can get washed away. So these are just where it's kind of location specific on when you want to do some of this stuff. Uh, another thing I will say is a lot of our hunting plots are within the timber. So if, if you have a, a food plot that you're planning on frost seeding, and most of this is perennial clover we're frost seeding, or, or maybe like a switchgrass screen or something like that, but like I'm talking more about perennial clover here. You have a, a food plot in the timber, smaller plot, but it, you know, you, you want to frost seed it. Okay, you go in there, there's snow on the on the plot. There's probably a lot of leaves under the snow. So if you frost seed as that snow starts to melt on top of on top of the snow. That snow is going to melt and it's going to leave that seed on top of the leaves so that you're not going to get germination. So this is another one where you want to wait until that snow melts, go in there, remove the leaves, and then you can go in there and frost seed. So I, I, I'm like we all are probably like jumping at the gun to get out there and, and get our habitat work done. But some of this stuff, it, it does make sense to wait just to make sure you're doing it right. And depending on where your food plot's located, again, like sometimes you do want to wait to, to frost seed. I know you got, you said you never get frost down there, or very rare. We, for here in Michigan, you know, I'm kind of you know, mid-Michigan area, we have a frost, a, an ending frost date of around mid-April. So we still have some time to, to frost seed. So to, kind of depending on where your food plot is, you, you do have more time than you think. But that was kind of a long answer, but it was one of those, you know, depending on your scenario, uh, yeah, same thing. So, but that would be, I guess, when I would do it. Man, that's really good. I I feel like we could just turn this into a frost seeding episode at this point <laughs> because I've got a couple of questions <laughs> to follow up with you. Uh, I'll just do the one though. Is this ever something where you would go into your plots? Like, let's say you know you've got a perennial clover plot that yep. maybe is a little a little spotty this year, so you know that you want to do a lot of work in there 
the following spring as things start to thaw. Will you go in there in the fall before it uh, really snows and starts to get some some snow packed on top and go ahead and take care of those leaves so that you are kind of ahead of the game just a little bit in the in the spring or does it not really matter? So for me, absolutely not. I don't want like so when those leaves are coming down, that's late October, early November. That's right. when we're that's like prime you know, end of the pre rut, start of the rut. I, I'm not going back there to do any sort of habitat work whatsoever. Like there's like I will clear off my access paths and all that stuff before the season starts. But once the season starts, like I'm only going in there to hunt and or, or maybe go in and get a, get a deer out, you know, when we take a shot. But it's yeah. So as far as getting the leaves off the plot, that doesn't happen until the snow melts after the season. So this year I was able to do it in mid-January because it was, we just had a really warm period there. All the snow melted, the leaves dried off. So I was able to get all my leaves off my plots pretty early, but that doesn't happen until after the season, because I don't want to be educating my deer, spooking my deer off my property. Even if I get one already and I'm kind of done hunting, I still treat my property as a sanctuary just to try to keep those deer alive to you know, get them one more year older. Right. Right. I'm curious, anybody else have anything to add when it comes to frost seeding? Maybe Lee down there in Tennessee. Well, I was, I was thinking about jumping in just because, you know, we have such a narrow window, you know, to get that done. Like, you know, this year, for example, as a prime example, we're all super busy with, you know, consulting season. I had my seed ordered. It was sitting in the shop. I was ready to go. And it's just been a really weird, you know, it's been an early spring. It was a really mild winter down here. It's probably that way for you too as well, Jake. But especially down here, it, it's been really mild got my seed and I'm, I'm afraid I've missed my last frost, you know? And, um, so as of right now I'm sitting on seed, but I love frost seeding and it's, it's one of the easiest ways, you know, I think to seed clover and it's just for us Southerners down here, boy, it's, it can be a narrow window. So I like starting a little bit earlier. I love February. Um, you know, you get into March, you start, you start gambling and with the further South you get on, on getting that, that frost. So, um, I'm crossing my fingers. You know, we, I live in a really weird climate right where I'm at. I mean, you can get some April freezes, you know, and then, but you may not get anything. So I, I think the optimum, you know, time frame for me would be in that February time frame. Late February, we're still going to get them. And I think that's kind of that sweet spot. You roll into March, we usually start getting some really good spring weather. And um, so it's, I'm, I'm a February guy. Yeah. So, but most importantly, we're talking about the freeze thaw cycle. So whenever that's, right. that's happening where you are, yep. uh, you know, whenever it's dipping down below freezing at night, getting up above freezing during the day, that's mm -hmm. a prime time for you to do it. Whether that's, that's right. in January where you are, or that's happening in early April where you are, that's the time when you want to be doing it. I sent you guys a picture a couple weeks ago. I was on a property in, uh, so Alabama season ended February 10th. And I think it was like February 13th. And I sent you guys pictures of green, you know, everything's flushing out with green and all of that. And it's like, man, there's, it's, uh, there, there is no frost seeding of anything here. Season just ended the rut, just what, you know, wound down and, uh, now things are greening up outside already. So, uh, not a, not a big window there. So, all right, sticking with the theme of food plots, then this is a really good question. And I've had several, uh, several clients ask me this as well. Why is it so important to wait for a rain? when you're planting is it uh, won't the seed just sit there and remain dormant this was asked specifically uh, this question was specifically about clover but let's expand that to all food plots why do we want to make sure that we can wait for rain won't it just sit there and remain dormant and be good to go here whenever we do get a rain in a week or two i can jump so, in on that oh go ahead go ahead lee no i was just going to say i mean you risk, you know, if there was a little bit of moisture there, but not enough moisture, you know, t for that seed to germinate. And this can be anything. This is this is typical farmer situation that you run into all the time. It's like, do I plant when it's that borderline dry and your seed germs, but then it, it dries out to the point where that it, it won't continue to grow and, and it dies. You can have that die off and it'll germ, but it won't continue to grow because it continues to be dry. So that's that's one of the number one reasons I would. I would avoid it until you, you're pretty comfortable with the rain or you had, you know, ample moisture because you don't want the germ no. and then it turn off dry. Right. Uh, along what Jake was saying earlier too, about the, the freeze thaw cycle, working those seeds into the soil. 
rain's going to do the same thing for you. Mm-hmm. The, the raindrops are going to come down. That's going to not only make the soil more more uh, susceptible or open it up a little bit and get those seeds in, and then it's going to start that germination process. So, so really, you know, people may seed and then try to drag things like that, but that rain is going to do a better job than any of that as far as getting good seed to soil contact. Right. Yeah, that's really good. And you know, for us, you know, here in in the deep deep south, you know, here in Georgia and in, even in Alabama. You know, this year was kind of a drought year heading into the fall. We didn't get a lot of rain and we had this rain that timed up really well when a lot of us are planting our food plots and we're talking October, right? So we're, we're a good bit later than most of you guys planting fall food plots, but we're, we're planting in October. We got a good rain coming. Everybody's out planting their plots and then we didn't get rain for like a month. And so everyone's plots germinated, looked great for two or three days and then died. And uh, it was a pretty sticky situation. So, you know, you want to make sure that you've got not just a little bit of rain, if possible, but rain, you know, maybe multiple rain events, two or three rain events, you know, uh, forecasted for the next, you know, two to three weeks or something along those lines. But uh, sticking with the food plot theme again, best time of year for planting your fall plots and planting your summer plots. This is going to vary by region. So I'm curious when you guys are doing it. Uh, Dylan, you want to start with you? Yeah, sure, Josh. I was going to say uh, with that, that is one thing we do get in a little bit of trouble with uh, being where we're at geographically. Geographically, you know, we're kind of right here in the middle to where uh, we can get some extremely warm temperatures. We've been fighting that drought as well. And so only had a few limited opportunities to plant. And I'll say late August is a lot of times kind of when we're looking to, to plant. But if that weather doesn't line up just right, you know, a lot of times we get guys that are anxious to plant. Regardless, you see a good rain and, you know, we don't get a lot of good quality fall rains until September a lot of years. So it sometimes it's better to wait. You know, you think you're getting that early jump and start, but man, you're really kind of rolling the dice there a lot of times and you might end up with total plot failure if you don't get the rains following, just like we you guys discussed about that dying out. It's just it's it could be, you know, nice cool down and then the next week you're right back up and all of a sudden that temp just keeps on a climb and it just sits out there and cooks. And it's just there's nothing worse. I mean you really can't apply enough water, you know, or have access to put water in there when you need to. I mean, it's just a, it's a tricky, tricky situation. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Anybody else? Uh, Dylan. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Dylan. I think you're you're exactly right. And that a lot of people get hung up on the date that they think that we need to plant. Um, But I'd rather be two or three weeks late on when I think I should get the seed in the ground. If that's when the weather is going to cooperate. You know, that's to me more important than saying August one, August 15, whatever the case may be. Uh, is to really make sure that it lines up with the weather. You bet. Yeah, yeah we get we get a lot of wind where we're at too. I was going to mention hunt, follow Jake there with that clearing that plot off. We get uh, Mother Nature takes care of those leaves for us out here in Kansas, so <laughs> I get some strong strong winds, which so, dries it out too. So yeah, I'll say this about spring. Um, spring here, I live in West Tennessee, big ag you know area and. So I lo- I love planting soybeans. Soybeans are one of my favorite uh, food plot, you know, uh, plants to plant for sure. But what I strategically do is wait for other farmers in the area to start planting. Uh, that way, it's everything is just not focused on my food plot because a lot of these areas are really secluded. And if that's the first game in town is my food plot, every deer is going to hammer that and, and may cause, you know, failure if you don't have it fenced off. I don't fence my stuff because I have a pretty low deer density, but if you have a higher deer density and you get out there too early, then, and you're the only game in town, it's going to suffer. Um, so I usually wait till I see a lot of farmers planting beans around me. And then I start, which is typically that last week of May for me is a really optimum time to, to start planting my soybeans, but I'm comfortable planting all the way into mid June on my beans. Uh, and then I love September. I love middle of September to late September on my fall plots and my fall greens. Uh, I just don't, you know, our climate down here, you know, it stays warm all the way through late October. And if you start too early in the South on those greens, it can get too mature. And you know, it's, it's a lot more palatable. There's a lot more energy in that plant in its young stages. So you, you don't want it to mature too much, you know, um, and get out there too early, like in August, you know, for us down South, like that mid to late September, I think is optimum on your greens. Yeah. Lee, quick, quick follow up on that. What's the smallest plot that you're going to plant soybeans in? 
Man, that's a loaded question. Um, yeah. So once again, it depends on your deer herd. So, you know, if your deer density is really high, man, it's, you're just going to really struggle. Those nice secluded little areas, those little pocket fields in the woods, they're going to get obliterated, you know, and, and you, it'll be hard to have a successful plot in some of those areas with just soybeans in there. Uh, most of my soybeans are in my destination type food, you know, sources, food plots that I can add diversity with beans and greens. It's just lights out one of the best things that I can plant. So I like them in my destination plots, which are usually around that two to, to eight acres is what I plant. And it's just boy, late season, just the, the pool and attraction that those areas of my farm have is just, it's a game changer. And I can stretch those bucks legs, you know, how I want them. I won't hunt my plot, you know, until late season. I hunt the travel the majority of the season. Uh, and then I go to that, that late season food source when I know he's rebuilding his body and he will be on those beans. And I know it's a huge debate on corn versus beans, you know, definitely in the South beans have a higher protein, you know, content than corn. And they will just, they will seek that bean in my opinion over the corn and this one, what I've seen, and it's a lot cheaper input cost to, to grow soybeans than, than corn as well. I love soybeans. But you need a certain soil type, obviously, too, that goes into that. I'm blessed with a silt loam, real silt loam type soil, Memphis silt loam. And, you know, I can I can raise a really good soybean. So that's another thing. If you live in some areas that your soil is not conducive to plant a soybean, don't go try it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always about trying it, but just pay attention to what kind of soil types you have. And, you know, don't don't plant the wrong the wrong mix there. Yeah, very good. Very good. I'm going to follow up uh, on all of this just to say this is a, the answer is pretty similar when it comes to timing of planting a food plot. Um, it's very similar to the, the conversation about frost seeding, right? We're more worried about conditions than uh, than about a certain date. Uh, Tim, you were saying that, right? Wasn't that, you were saying that just a second ago? Yeah, I think we have a framework of a time that we want to put these in for the spring and the fall, but but exactly weather conditions is always going to dictate within that window when we when we want to plant. Right, right. And for uh, for me, that's usually in the spring. That soil temperature gets above sixty five degrees. I have pretty good confidence that it's warm enough to be growing some of my warm season stuff. Uh, kind of the same thing in the fall, coming back down. Those soils soil temperatures start to dip below sixty five degrees, then I feel pretty confident that we can uh, that we can you know do something with that, but uh yeah down here in the south man you can get a heat wave in late october that can really really mess some things up if you've got your greens planted too early so all right let's talk about food plots in tough places specifically really really low-lying areas marshes and swamps we've got a lot of that here in georgia jake you got a lot of that up there in michigan tim i know you've got a lot of that there in wisconsin dylan you guys don't have any water in the whole state, so I don't know. I don't know what you- <laughs> it's pretty dry. Yeah. No, we don't deal with a whole lot of the swamps. It, it uh, is appealing, though. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, right, right. So, uh, yeah, guys, what, what are you planting for low-lying areas, or are you just going to avoid, you know, planting in a marshy, swampy type of terrain? And, and if so, what do you tell the 40-acre landowner who's got 40 acres of marsh? Well, yeah, you have to be able to, I guess, one, you have to make sure that it's not like a wetland. That's like probably number one if it, it's not protected. And because if it's not, if it's protected, then you can't really do much. And let, so let's just say it's not protected. The first, you have to f- try to find a place that's dry enough, at least during like maybe the summer, early fall, August, to get in there with some equipment or maybe hand tools to to, to plant a plot. Like you're not going to be able to plant anything if it, if it's standing water. So right. you, you have to find an area with. Uh, you know, that it's at least dry enough to plant. And, and we, we do have some food plots like that. So it's, it's uh, right next to a, a lower area swamp system that moves through thicker swamp system. And, and those for me anyways, are, are more of those micro plots. Those, those, uh, maybe, and sometimes these are like, they're not, a lot of times I like to plant my plots, the smaller staging plots, like on the way to the destination. But sometimes I make an exception for these really small plots that are right within that, 
cover that, that thick swamp. It, it might be like a tenth of an acre. So I'm talking really small. It, you just make a little bit of a clearing, and because it's so small, you you, you don't really plant your your annual like your brassicas or you know soybeans things like that because they're just going to get wiped out. Again, this is going to be more of your your browse tolerant. You know your clovers, your rye, stuff like that. But just to draw those deer out of that area, that swamp, and these are really attractive during the rut. So when the buck has that doe pinned down in that swamp and he's not letting her leave, you know, that food plot is the, probably the closest thing. It's right within the cover. He'll, he'll let her go there, and, but he's not going to let her out of her, he's not going to let her out of his sight. And so that's where a lot of times, you know, we get opportunities at these older boxes on these really small, you know, micro food plots. Again, like probably a tenth of an acre, maybe even smaller than that, we, right, right next to the marsh setting or, or right next to the, right next to the swamp yeah i like that so you mentioned uh you know clovers and that kind of thing you guys have any other crops that you're trying to grow in in some wetter locations well not not a crop per se but something i wanted to mention is is in those areas maybe where it's just hey it's going to be too wet to put a food plot in, or maybe uh, another factor there is we do a soil test and even though it's a little dry, it's just not conducive to growing. Uh, that's when I think I advise clients more to start focusing on those natural browse sources and then enhancing those. Um, one of my favorites to go to in those wet areas is something like red osier dogwood, uh, getting something like that established, um, you know, kind of creating a concentration of it in, a, in the area that you want to hunt can be just as good of a pull as a food plot could be. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, a, a lot of times we're better off not trying to fight mother nature when it comes to a really wet area, you know, down here, joint vetch is great. Um, or there are several different blends that we can use, um, that are kind of just the, the, you know, the generic blend. And, and a lot of times I'll throw that and say, all right, we'll see what comes up. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll see what, what can do well here. We have a lot of seasonal, uh, swamps and marshes down here where we are too. So, one year it may be extremely wet, the next year it may be pretty dry. And so you kind of have to plant not knowing what the season is going to be like. So we just know, hey, for some of these plots, some years it's just not going to take very well. Um, Tim, <clears throat> I actually have a client who ordered some red osier dogwood to try to grow it down here in Georgia. So I'm curious to see uh, how that will do because I I've never seen it this far south. I don't know. Lee, you guys don't I, have it in Tennessee. Well, do you? I, when Tim said that, that's where I was going to chime in. Like, I, so I live in hill country, you know, but I do hunt some, you know, areas that have swamp and slough country uh, as well. So I, I'm very familiar with it, and I do plant. That's what I plant are my, you know, the I don't. I have tried red orange dogwoods in the south. Uh, usually it fails. Um, so I like the silky dogwoods, um, stuff like that. I plant. Lordy, I bet I planted 500, you know, on my personal farm. And, and a lot of it goes through some of those lower areas where I can't get, you know, uh, other crops to, to raise. And But I want to manipulate that travel. That's what I will switch to are those natural browse type plots. And they're they're really good for other, you know, uh, animals as well. You know, you're, you're, if you're trying to, to get quail or, you know, your turkey nesting, they love, you know, those silky dogwoods for our southerners and, you know, stuff like that is, it's awesome. And man, it's, it's like candy to them. You know, that red orgia, it is true candy to the deer. Uh, but silky is as well. They love the leaves of that silky dogwood. And, um, so you can, you can mix and match some of that with, you know, elderberry and, uh, other, other various types as well. So it doesn't have to be red orgia if you're in the South. Um, I've had some clients that have tried red orgia in the South and it failed. So, it just doesn't like the heat that we get is, right. is the problem. Right, right. All right, last food plot question, and then we're going to move on to a different topic. In fact, we might be moving on to a different episode uh, just because we do have a lot more questions to get through here. Uh, but I think this is one that, that's going to be a good one for us to cover. What's the time interval for spraying plots in the summer to make sure you get a good kill on, on your weeds? So if you're coming in, you're trying to spray a plot, terminate whatever's in there, whether it be weeds or maybe a, a you know a standing crop. Uh, what does that look like for you? Are you coming in spraying one time and then calling it good? Are you going to spray multiple times? If so, what's the what's the time in between? For me, like I like to 
I like to plant in the fall. So even if I'm a, like if I'm throwing like I have my annuals for the hunting season that's going in in the fall, like or around like the first rain after August first, uh, or if I, even if I'm establishing a perennial plot, I like to plant that in the fall as well. So I will take the if it's a new plot, I'm going to take the entire growing season the first year to treat the weeds. And so that normally starts for me here in mid Michigan around early May, mid May kind of depends on the year a little bit, but a lot of times it's that early May and then I'll hit it hard with glyphosate and two, four D. And then it's about a four to six weeks waiting period until you, it starts to green up again. And then you hit it again with that same, that same mix glyphosate and two, four D. And then you, Kind of, and that can then that will bring you right in another six weeks into that August first time frame. And then, if the, there is going to be some grasses, maybe some broadleaf weeds that are going to come back that last time, but it should be the, for the most part dead. But I'm going to hit it one more time with just glyphosate this next time because that 2,4-D it's going to stay in the soil. It has a little bit of a residual effect. It's going to stay in the soil, so I want to remove that from the last spraying. And so I'll just hit it with glyphosate, and then right after that really the, the next rain event that, that uh, is in the forecast, I'm going to plant right before it. So that, that should give that. So it's three sprayings starting around, you know, early May and then probably mid June, you know, and then that'll give, that'll bring you into like August 1st. Right. Right. What's the benefit of trying to start, you know, at a time like early May, as opposed to why don't we just wait until the very end of the summer and then spray? You, I think you get, uh, better better seed to soil contact especially for those guys that like let's say you you don't have great soil like lee if you have a lot of sand and you have a ton of weeds if you wait to spray in let's just say you sprayed late july all that stuff's going to die off and then it's just going to be a thatch on top of your of your ground and then your seed it's just going to smother your seeds you might your seeds might not make it down there depending on what you're planting so i, I really like to come into my planting with bare dirt you know maybe it, like, a lot of sandy soil around here so you might be able to lightly disc it drag it but we're not really busting the tiller out to work that stuff in you know we're, we're trying to you know, minimal soil disturbance so the we kind of use chemical to accomplish that and then ho hopefully if you're able to do that you know, you've killed those weeds for the entire growing season you're not going to be dealing with weeds, hopefully, in that plot for a long time. Because if you get into like a like a cover crop rotation, you know, where you plant your fall annuals and you top it with cereal rye, you can bring that to the next year. Then you can plant a summer cover crop to smother everything, you know, choke out all the weeds. Then you can plant your fall crop into that, smash that down. So you can kind of control your weeds going forward that way. But you have to start it with a, a pretty good weed control with chemical. At least that's how I do it. Right, right. No, that's good. That was that was exactly where I was hoping you would go, and that just brought up a whole different uh, episodes worth of questions right there. So I'm I'm going to leave that alone. But when it comes to you know establishing a new plot, there's a lot of folks these days who are trying to move to a no-till planting system. Uh, a lot of folks who want to emphasize minimal soil disturbance and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot you got to do to get started, though. Like it, it pays sometimes to bring in the equipment early to get things started, get things rolling. And, you know, these same guys also don't want to use a lot of herbicides and that kind of stuff, which I totally understand. That stuff freaks me out, man. I don't, I don't like touching chemicals. I, I don't, I don't like it. Uh, but sometimes you got to get a jump on things. Sometimes you got to get it under control before you can, like you said, manage it well with what we're, what we're planting. Yeah. But it's kind of like a necessary evil this right off the bat. You got to use it just to get things under control, but, but then hopefully right. if you do it right and you, you you kill those weeds and address them. You, your food plot is going to keep those weeds suppressed going forward. Right, right. All right, guys. Well, we're going to end this episode here. Here, does anybody have anything else to add when it comes to food plots? I didn't know this was going to become the food plot Q and A episode, but that's what it has become. Great questions from folks. Glad that uh, glad we could cover a lot of this. I think this is going to be helpful. But any closing thoughts? Real quick, Josh, just, just, this may only be limited to the Midwest. I, I doubt it, though. I will say just if you let some of these get away from you at times, uh, there are a few poor man's methods, you know, that I feel like we use here, especially on those plots that turn into jungles where you may have got a kill on it, but it was a little bit later in the summer and it's so thick and maybe you don't have a uh, either a brush hog or a way to get that thatch to the ground. 
we utilize burning and I got to be careful saying this cause I'm on the fire department, but, uh, you got to obviously have all the right equipment for that and don't take on something that you can't, you know, manage. But the good thing about that time of year, you're a lot greener on your surroundings. So it's a little safer, but I've had really good luck just getting good kills and then actually following that up with some burning, which also will kill out some of those weeds more so than maybe even the spray would have got to it. But you may have to come back and hit that again before you plant. Yep, absolutely. That's a really good point. Burning off those food plots that have kind of uh, gotten away from you, especially when you're doing a small burn. It can be, you know, it can be really effective really quick too. Um, but uh, I always like to tell folks, especially folks with a, you know, a volunteer fire department down the road kind of thing, like give them a call, <laughs> get to know them a little yeah. bit, figure out, Hey, is somebody actually going to be there that day? Cause there are some around here, you know, Tuesday and Thursday, somebody's at the station Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nobody's going to be there. It's like, eh, how about you do your burn on a Thursday then? And how about you yeah. give them a heads up beforehand? So uh, yeah, just making sure you're being careful. So guys, thanks for joining me today for this Q&A. And uh, we're going to kick the rest of them off to uh, to the next episode. So I appreciate your time.